Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm your host, Hannah Matluck, and today we are here with Charity Hill, a physiatrist at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's awesome to be here. So can you tell us how you first got started in your career as a physiatrist? So I first got started, I was an athlete in high school and college, and I really wanted to do kind of sports medicine and spine. I had tons of injuries, a lot of pain, um, which I at the time attributed to my spine. Um, and so that's what initially led me into the field of physiatry. And what conditions do you specialize in as a physiatrist? Um, at this point, I'm specifically focusing just on pelvic pain uh, for men and women. So what, what symptoms are people coming into your office with? So it can come as a variety of things. Sometimes people injure themselves working out or lifting weights. That could be pain in the lower abdomen or pubic bone. Sometimes it's pain um, in the genitals. Um, or pain with intercourse. And what about conditions such as endometriosis and interstitial cystitis, vaginismus, vulvodynia? Do you treat all of those as well? We treat all of those as well. And what, as a physiatrist, what, how do you treat these conditions? And that's a really good question because they're people will say you're a muscle and nerve specialist and so how are you dealing with the uterus and the bladder and you right. know, the bowels? Um, but really it's all a interconnected web and as physiatrists we're trained um, in multidisciplinary team leading and so we can uh, help coordinate a team of physicians that can help treat the multitude of problems that come along with pelvic pain patients. So when, when someone comes to your office, what are some treatment options that you and the other physiatrists in your office will recommend as the first step in treatment? And so the first step in treatment almost always involves physical therapy and a physical therapist to kind of follow the timeline of the patient as they heal and recover. Um, we also use medications, injections, other adjunct therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, and any other doctors we need to bring on board to make sure everything's taken care of. Can you talk a little bit more about the medications that you use and the different injections that you use as well? Sure, absolutely. So a lot of the medications we're using are either trying to treat some of the overactive bladder symptoms directly or the bowel symptoms directly. Um, but the most common one we're using are medications to decrease nerve hyperactivity. And so they're commonly caused, called neuropathic pain medications. And you see successful results with these medications? It's definitely helpful, but though usually on their own, they're not enough to treat the condition, um, but it can be helpful as part of the full program. And how does the nervous system play such a large role of people who have chronic pain? The nervous system does a very good job trying to protect our body when it perceives an injury. And right. so when you have something like pain, the nervous system gets recruited um, to go into almost like a fight or flight mode where it'll cause the muscles to spasm down and contract to try to protect the area that's painful. Um, and that engages parts of the central nervous system as well, kind of in that um, fight or flight feedback loop. And so that unfortunately in pelvic pain can keep the problem persisting rather than, uh, rather than actually helping anything. So that's part of what we're trying to um, calm down when we're looking at decreasing the central sensitization. And then in terms of the injections that you use, where are you injecting, where in the body, and what is the ingredient in the injections, and what does that look like? So with the injections, we examine patients and figure out which nerves and muscles are bothering them, and then we can specifically target those nerves and muscles um, doing either nerve blocks or trigger point injections. Um, and we use an ultrasound, and typically the needle will pass through through the skin of the, of the bottom. <laughs> essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, nothing is going internal. Um, what we use inside is lidocaine, which is uh, an, the nerve blocking medication. And then we'll use an anti-inflammatory, either dexamethasone, which is a cortisone, um, or we can use Tramil, which is a homeopathic or plant-based anti-inflammatory. And you're part of a network and a team of physiatrists that specialize in pelvic pain, which is rare because there aren't that many pelvic pain specialists in America and in the world. 
So what is some advice that you could give to some physicians who may be listening that are physiatrists or not physiatrists but do treat pelvic pain in order to help them understand how large of a problem this is and how we really need more physicians and pelvic pain specialists to focus on this really big problem in America and in the world? Well, I think one of the big issues is just the medical education is still a little behind the times. When I was in medical school, I was taught by my um, preceptor that people with pelvic pain are crazy. He thought it was invented if it wasn't from an STD um, or another infection, then he thought it was just made up and they were just trying to get drugs. And so one of the first thing I would say is just kind of acknowledge that the majority of patients actually do have pain even if you can't really see it or identify exactly what's going on. Um, and they can always look into resources like the International Pelvic Pain Society um, or contact us at the Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine Group um, to try to get more education and understanding for these patients. A lot of times all they want is acknowledgement <laughs> um, that what they're dealing with is real and then um, you can get them to someone else who can get a plan in place to try to help them. Yeah, and I talked to a young girl the other day who she's, tw I think, 20, was 20 years old, and she said that she was having vulvodynia and painful sex for about six months, and she went to, which unfortunately isn't really that long in terms of the amount of times many women are in pain with these conditions for, but it took, she went to many doctors in New York, and it took her six months to finally find a doctor who confirmed that she had pelvic floor dysfunction and vulvodynia. And she said when she left that appointment, just having the validation and having a doctor understand her and give her the correct diagnosis, she said she felt 50% better. It wasn't all in her head because she then continued to do physical therapy and went on medications and took the right steps to fully heal, but she just felt so much relief from having her pain be validated and properly diagnosed. Absolutely. When when doctors are dismissive, it kind of increases the fight or flight and response the and the anxiety, and so it can really escalate pain levels in that way. Um, and that may be historically why people thought this is in their head, but you know, really it's just an escalation of the central sensitization when they're not getting proper care. Definitely. And you treat men as well. We do treat men as well. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, There's a whole stigma behind men who have pelvic pain and they're more hesitant to talk about it. Can you tell us what conditions you see in men and how the symptoms present? Absolutely. They surprisingly present very similarly to how they do in women as far as the bowel and bladder dysfunction, the sexual pain and dysfunction that can come along with it. I think historically men may have been less willing to open up to some of their peers about this, but online groups are kind of giving them a little anonymity and um, more freedom to, to discuss with other people what issues are going on. Um, but half of my patients are men. I think this half. is yeah, yeah, I think this is as prevalent in men as it is in women. Um, and I think awareness is growing and hopefully it will continue to grow. Um, in men specifically, it's historically been misdiagnosed as an infection of the prostate or chronic prostatitis, um, even though no bacteria ever really show up in the samples. Um, so we're trying to help educate that this is really more a muscle and nerve and, and pelvic floor dysfunction um, and pain condition that's not really associated with an infection or prostatitis. So what's causing these problems and this pain in men? So a lot of things can trip it up. They obviously don't have endometriosis, which is a common cause for it in women. Um, sometimes it's a hip injury. Uh, sometimes it's a sports hernia or an inguinal hernia. And a lot of times it's, I've seen it from accountants who spend 18 to 20 hours a day sitting during busy season. Um, and just the pressure on the pudendal nerve will start it up. Or people who do a lot of spinning classes can sometimes um, spiral into a pelvic pain cycle just from the pressure on the pudendal nerve from a uh, improperly fitted bike seat. And what does the treatment look like for men? Is it similar to women with the medications and injections? The treatment is almost identical other than we don't have to bring in an obstetrician to possibly help address endometriosis. But other right. than that, uh, the medications that we use, the injections we use are very, very similar. Um, and, to the women. And just to clarify, as um, a physiatrist, the injections are external. You don't, 
you're not injecting vaginally or onto the penis, but they're all around the pelvic area externally. Exactly. Everything's happening through um, through the butt cheek, mm -hmm. uh, through the gluteus, gluteus maximus, and we can use the ultrasound to guide us into the deeper structures of the pelvic floor um, and around the nerves that are affecting the pelvic pain. And since you believe, and I believe as well, that pelvic pain is just as large of a problem in men as in women, do you have any advice for how men can start to talk about this more and be more open about it? I talk with the men that I see because they feel sometimes like a freak of nature. They feel right. like no one could possibly understand. And I let them know, probably if you told your friends, one in eight or one in 10 of them are gonna have the same thing. Um, and I've actually had several who ended up referring colleagues because once they do open up, they realize their coworkers and colleagues are dealing with the same condition. And once they're feeling better, they want the people around them to be able to get some relief too. So um, I think it's just the wheels are starting to turn, um, but it's just getting people to open up on topics that have been considered taboo in the past. Um, but I hope that dialogue is changing. And even for women, I find it very similar that the more you talk about it, the more you connect with other women who have similar conditions and they gravitate towards you as well because they know that you're talking about it and you know someone else who's talking about it and everyone wants to connect with someone who's going through what they're going through. So I've found that talking about it is really, really powerful. Absolutely. And I'm very open. I've had, I have endometriosis and I've had pelvic pain. I've been through the physical therapy and injections. And I'm fairly open with my patients about that too, so I can let them know, like, you oh, I relate. really understand what you're going right. through, and um, and I know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and there's a better way to live, and um, and there's a possibility for relief. And I think that that also provides another level of hope and optimism for your patients because they know that you can really relate and understand and empathize with what they're going through. Absolutely. Even even the males, I was like, it's right. such a similar, it's such a similar experience in spite mm -hmm. of in spite of different anatomy. Pain in that area is pain in, in that exactly. area, and no one. It makes everyone feel, yeah, pretty bad. Yeah, and the effect it can have on relationships, mental and health, mental health. It's it's a pretty it drastic toll, effects yeah. on both men and women. So for men who are having trouble navigating this world of pelvic pain and finding their pelvic health care team. And if they have pain, but don't know necessarily how they can take the first step or who to see, can you give any recommendations for them? And so I would say the best resource is probably the International Pelvic Pain Society. Um, and you can search for providers on their website and that will help kind of give you links to people who are more in the know, who will understand better rather than just going to your neighborhood urologist. Um, hopefully that will be a good start of a resource um, to get into a physical therapist or a physician who will have better understanding for your condition. And you, you at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine and the other physicians that you work with have a close network of other physicians that you refer out to and you have great communication with them and you're always being educated on the treatment plan for your individual patients, which is so important. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of this and how it really does help to heal and put patients on the right track to healing better than if individual providers aren't connecting? Absolutely. I could not treat this by myself. It takes a whole team of doctors and providers um, some cases are more simple, and it's me and a physical therapist. Most will involve others, like a urologist, a gastroenterologist, um, and the physical therapist, sometimes a cognitive behavioral therapist or an EMDR therapist. Um, it just, communication is key, so everyone is on the right page and has the patient's best interest um, at heart. For sure. And are there any other resources that you want to recommend to the audience? They can always go to our website. It's pelvicrehabilitation.com. It has a lot of great articles and insights, especially um, for the male pelvic pain, um, which can be hard to find on some other sites. And so that would be my other recommendation. Thank you. And lastly, do you want to talk a little bit about the new location that pelvic rehabilitation is expanding on? Absolutely. So we have been having people 
fly in to see us from all over the country and the world. And uh, we're trying to essentially get closer to them. And so we're opening locations in places where we were having the most patients coming from. So I'll be relocating to Miami, Florida, um, to the Coral Gables area. And so we'll be opening up an office there um, just so we can try to bring our services closer to where people are. It's um, amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. We're excited. Wonderful. It's important that your resources and the work that you do and pelvic rehabilitation medicine does is spread throughout the country and the world because so many people don't have access to this really high, high quality level of work. Absolutely, that's the goal. And where can you be contacted? Uh, the best place is pelvicrehabilitationmedicine.com. Amazing, thank you. Thanks for being here and for sharing your knowledge and for doing the work that you do and helping so many patients heal every day. Absolutely, great to meet you. Thank you, you too. And for those of you who found this video interesting, please leave a comment below and share it with anyone else who you think may benefit. Thank you. Mm -hmm.